As you can see, I'm sitting at a very, very old organ. It has a long history and it has a remarkable sound. And one of the things that makes the sound so special is that it has a mean tone temperament. And that means that it's not the normal temperament like in a, a normal piano or a modern organ, but it's quite special. It has eight perfect thirds. And actually to demonstrate what it is like to have this temperament, it's very easy to explain because in music there's always a problem with keyboard instruments. You can't make an every interval really pure. So let's demonstrate it uh, with some thirds. So I have a C and an E. And in this case, it's a perfect interval. So they're really in tune. Now if I put a perfect third on the E, I end up with a G sharp. And that's also perfect on this organ. But then we have a problem. The perfect third on a G sharp is actually a B sharp. And a keyboard instrument doesn't have a B sharp, it has a C. And of course you want to end up with the same C as you started with. So if I have G sharp and C together, it sounds horrible. And that's the basic problem of keyboard instruments. There is a difference between this B sharp and a C, and a difference you have to divide over the different keys. So if you divide it in 12, then you suddenly have the modern temperament, the equal temperament, and that's kind of boring because everything sounds the same. On an old organ like this, you really have some character because eight of the thirds are pure, are perfect, and the other ones are actually quite unusable. So the eight perfect thirds are on C, on D, on E flat, on E, on F, on G, on A, and on B flat. But if I would make uh, a, perf a third on, uh, let's say, F sharp, you can tell that it's unusable. So it really forces you to play a certain kind of music. And in this case, this organ is perfect for Renaissance music. Uh, there's another special feature of this organ. Uh, the key keyboard is quite small, as you can see. It goes up till C3. But down here it ends at an E, at least it looks like it ends on an E, but that's not completely true. It has a short octave, and that means if I go down from C, uh, I can go down till F, and for the lowest three notes, the E, the D, and the C, I need also uh, the upper keys. So that is quite special here. So if I scale down, it's like this. <laughs> By the way, you can immediately tell that the principal forefoot is in the facade, except for the biggest one. The C is actually inside, it's a wooden pipe, and you can immediately tell the difference between the pipe here uh, above my head and the facade, the D, and then the C made out of wood. Well, and let's start with this sound, the principal forefoot. Uh, like I said, in mean tone temperament, and just for fun I will show you in this little demonstration that you can go to different keys, but you really have sometimes a special sound because of this temperament.
excitement in the music when you have chromatic scaling up or down or going to a key that is just about right or not and that gives you very special flavors in the sound. And actually you can also imagine why the Renaissance was a huge step from coming from the Gothic period because the Gothic times were all about fifths. So if I would play something kind of in a Gothic style, it was all about playing a uh, plain song melody, for example, some Gregorian chant, and on top of it with a fifth, you make some ornaments. Uh, actually, it sounds really bad on an organ like this because this is all about perfect thirds. And in the Gothic times, they would have an organ with perfect fifths. But just to give you an idea, it probably sounded something like this. Going from this to the, the triads with the perfect thirds. That must have been an, an earthquake in, in music. It was a very big step to take. Uh, and of course you can tell that in the Renaissance they really liked their triads in root position. So that's why you don't need a C sharp, a D sharp, uh, something like that in the, in the bass. Because why use it? You can't use those triads. So it's actually great fun to play this old Renaissance music on an organ that really supports it. So we've heard the principal four foot. Um, we of course have a geduct eight foot as well to support the whole sound of the organ. It's a very soft eight foot. Sometimes in a Renaissance organ it can be really wide and loud uh, that you have wide scaled pipes with a lot of lead. But this one is actually quite soft and intimate. eight foot together with the principal four foot. three foot that we can add. It gives uh, the sound a more broader sound because it gives the fifth. So instead of going up all the time with an eight four, eight four and a two foot, you get a complete different sound with this fifth that is added.
And now you would expect when you have the, the two foot, the octava two foot added in this ensemble, that it gets this really sharp spiky sound, but the two foot is actually very soft. So it gives a little edge to the sound, but only a little, it's not very loud. Sesquialtra, and it's on the whole manual, so you can't really use it as a solo stop, but it's uh, to be used in the ensemble. And of course, a sesquialtra has a fifth and a third in it, and that makes it so interesting in a mean tone temperament. Then you can use a sesquialtra really easy in the plenum sound because it mixes very well with the perfect thirds that you already have in the sound. <laughs> principle sound and that's an eight foot principle in the treble and of course that stop you can use for playing a solo if you combine it for example with a four foot flute so now I can play with my left hand the four foot flute in the bass and in the treble I have the principle eight and of course with that four foot flute so now I have a solo sound <laughs> foot flute by itself sounds like this. also a Gemschwarn two foot that you can use very nicely together with the four foot flute.
even on its own, the GEMS 1 2 foot sounds very nice. Finally, there is also one stop that uh, only works in the bass, and that's a one-foot flute, which is actually a special stop, because you have to be quite creative to find use for it in literature playing, because what to do with a one-foot that, uh, that you only have in the bottom two octaves. But for example, together with the four-foot flutes, it sounds really nice. <laughs> So with the Gemshorn two foot. So that's all the stops we have in this organ. So let's improvise a partita, some variations on a beautiful old hymn tune and maybe I am even going to use some of the dance forms that they used very often in Renaissance times. It's actually interesting to see that the music of the church and the music of the world was interacting quite a bit uh, and also that some things were not really separated. So in church you could have wonderful music around Genevan Psalms for example in the Netherlands but uh, during weekdays uh, and probably on Sundays after the service uh, an organist could play whatever he liked, so it could also be folk songs, you could have some special sounds in your organ like uh, birds, uh, drums or even bells, so that you could really make some fun in dance-like music. So let's see if I com can combine the two worlds a little bit on this beautiful little jam.